Good morning, church. Welcome to worship. Welcome to our celebration of the high holiday of Pentecost. And for anyone who may be tuning in with us, uh, happening to come by our website and join the service this morning, my name is Gary Richards. I'm a pastor here at the Belmont Watertown United Methodist Church. And if you're, you're new and this is your first visit, I'm so glad that you blessed us uh, with your participation in worship this morning. As I said, this is the celebration of Pentecost, the celebration of God's spirit entering into a group of people, a spirit that came to disrupt, not in a negative way, but a disruption of love, the power of God's spirit setting in motion again, not for the first time, but again, God's intent for all of creation and all of God's creatures to experience the glory of God through love. And so we gather here on this day to celebrate the holy disruption of God's life-giving spirit. Welcome to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Pentecost Day has arrived, but on this day we are not together. Wait, hear the good news. No distance will separate us from God's love. Lord, Send your Holy Spirit. Gift us with your creative presence. Pentecost Day has arrived. Expect God to surprise you. Be ready to dream dreams and speak of God's mighty works. Lord, send your life-giving Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. In today's hymn, Number 539, O Spirit of the Living God. Join me in today's opening prayer. Lord, how good it is to celebrate your transforming love. On this special Sunday, we remember Jesus' promise to not leave us alone. Thank you, O oh God, for the guidance and power of your spirit. When we are clueless, you send a vision, and when we are lost, you send a direction. O oh Lord, bless us with your ideas and give us courage to act upon them. Mold us into your holy vessels and fill us until your spirit overflows upon our church and community. Amen. Join us in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When Pentecost Day arrived, 
they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya bordering, bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered, and some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered them, uh, jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood. Before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brian, for leading us in worship this morning and for sharing with us God's word for this Pentecost Sunday. Let us pray. Come, O Holy Spirit, come. Let yourself be known to us. Come and fill our hearts. Come and fill that space that we have left open for you. Come and occupy, take residence in our homes. Join us, lift us, inspire us in this time of worship. Come, O Holy Spirit, come and guide us into the new week. Strengthen us where we may be weak. Give us hope, O Spirit of the living God, where we may be struggling with doubt. Come, O Holy One, and bring us justice. Come, O Holy One, and let your justice flow through the streets of our cities and towns with peace. Reconcile your people, O Lord, 
and to the way of your holy peace. Help us, O oh Lord, to write the structures and systems that deny life. Be with us, O oh Holy Spirit, and, and give us the healing strength that we need to walk with one another in this time of uncertainty and pandemic. Come, O oh Holy One, and gather your church together. Disrupt our hearts and minds the power of your love. Amen. Our God is a disruptive God. There's no other way to say it. Our God is a disruptive God who breaks and has always broken into history to create and recreate, always pointing towards salvation and new life. Our God is a disruptive God. The Holy Spirit, for example, disrupts the life of a simple teenage peasant woman. Mary was simply trying to live her life, get ready for a new life as a wife, soon to be married to a common laborer. But then the Holy Spirit came into her life and disrupted it. Remember, go back to that story that we're so fond of when we're getting near that celebration of new life, Christmas. First, God sends a couple of messengers, starts a conversation with Mary, lets her know of God's plan, a plan to disrupt her life. Mary learns about God's inbreaking. An inbreaking not only into her life, but through her life into all of creation. Mary learns of how she will become a vessel of God's new creation. But she was uncertain, wondering how could this be? For she is as she claims through the words of the gospel, still a virgin. The angels respond and give that answer of disruption, saying the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Disruption in the life of a common peasant waiting for her new life in marriage. Little did she know that she would be setting in motion God's disruptive power in the life of a baby that would live into the world as Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Mary continues to experience God's inbreaking and disruption as she goes to travel and to visit with her cousin, Elizabeth. And there she finds Elizabeth expecting her firstborn. And Elizabeth feels the joy of Mary's arrival through the joy of her unborn child, who is jumping for joy in her womb. And Mary experiences Elizabeth, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, as these two expecting mothers unite. Our God is a disruptive God who breaks into history, creating and recreating life for God's holy purposes. How about Jesus, the holy disruptor here on earth? Jesus himself proclaimed God's inbreaking, God's disruption, as a young preacher in his home synagogue. Jesus turns to the inbreaking of the life of the prophet Isaiah, and he claims a particular text for himself, a text that Isaiah shared with his congregation, proclaiming, and I quote from Scripture, the Lord 
is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And even before Jesus preached his early sermon in the synagogue, the Spirit was disrupting his life. Go back to the baptism of Jesus. When the Spirit came down upon him, where the dove descended upon him, and all that were present for the baptism witnessed that disruption, where Jesus was transformed, baptized by the waters, by John, baptized by the Holy Spirit and sent out into the wilderness, led by the Spirit, another disrupting force in the life of Jesus. Led off into the wilderness for 40 days, where he was tempted to deny the power of the Spirit. Betrayed his allegiance and his loyalty for earthly powers. But no. Jesus remained faithful, inspired, strengthened, and driven by the Spirit. And descended that mountain, retreated from the wilderness into the world to make known to others the power and the promise of the Holy Spirit. My point here this morning in going through these Bible stories with you is that God's life-giving and disruptive spirit has proceeded. The birth of the church came before the birth of Jesus and has always been since creation, creating and recreating life for God's purposes. Today we celebrate our disruptive God. The Holy One who enters humanity. The Holy One who is a power that comes into our lives to, to make good on God's promises. The Creator who freely acts with boundless grace, incorporating God's people into God's radical enterprise of love. This is our disruptive God. Blessed are we who from time to time get in on what this disruptive God is doing through the power, the power of God's life-giving and transforming spirit. And that's what we gather to celebrate this morning. This is why we take this special time in the life of the church to pause and to go into the deep understanding of what makes us who we are today in ministry and mission, and what gives us the fuel for our dreams and our visions of how we can be who we have been called to be in this life as the church. Jesus instructed his faithful friends and anyone who would listen to him to expect God's inbreaking, to expect God to be disruptive, to expect God to, to come into your life and maybe shake it up a little bit or a lot. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples to wait. There's a gift coming, it's the advocate. It's the one who will provide words and direction so that you can continue doing the work that I've been doing with you. And remember, of course, Jesus says, even this, you'll do greater works than I have done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Love of Jesus is the key to this power. As Jesus says in the gospel, if you love me and you're faithful to my commandments, you will experience this power, this gift of the advocate, this friend who will come and accompany you as you march forward in ministry in my name. 
love of God in Christ is the gateway to the gift of the advocate. And love of God in Christ and faithfully living the way that Jesus has taught us to live is the pathway. It's all for us to experience and to be open to and to be ready to be the vessels that will allow us not only to be filled, but to overflow with God's love for the world. To join in with God in this disruptive work of, of changing hearts and minds and people in the way of life. Leaning away from the powers that seek to separate us from God, but leaning into those very powers that join us to God and one another. Acts chapter 2, which is the source of Brian's reading this morning, feeds our biblical imagination. It's a powerful story. It's a powerful story because you can imagine a group of people gathered, a large group of people, people of all different locations, experiences in life cultures, skin colors, and of course, languages. Faithful Jews that had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, the time of the giving of the law to the Jews. They were there for a purpose, to celebrate God's inbreaking into the life of the people of Israel. As I said, God had been breaking into the lives of God's people since the first day. And here we have this wonderful story for ourselves today. Jesus told his witnesses and his followers to expect this day. It wasn't for them to know when, but for them to expect and to anticipate God's inbreaking. And all together in one place, they were there. And all together in one place, they experienced that in breaking. The creative power of God coming into their space and their time. A loud wind, hollowing, disruptive, claiming all their senses for that period of time, for that exact moment. For that time of unity with God and God's people. But did all understand what was happening? No, of course not. It was a time of confusion and chaos and disruption. But there would be a moment of clarity. God's loud and mighty disruptive wind fills the entire house and collectively and individually claiming and empowering the gathered believers for God's holy purposes. The barriers of language melted away, declaring God's mighty works in many tongues. There was amazement. There was bewilderment. There was doubt. The barriers of language melted away, and, and God's Mighty deeds were proclaimed. But still, the group that had received this gift were faced with being dismissed. For those who had also experienced it were uncertain of this disruption to the point where they just picked a, an easy answer to their question, what had happened? They suggested that the group had got into the new wine too early and that they weren't right of mind and heart. It wasn't possible for some to think that God would break in and do such a thing, transform hearts and minds for God's purposes. Well, Peter, taking the role as a leader, 
interrupted this time of doubt and dismissive behavior and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not what you think it is. As a matter of fact, it's, and this is rather comical, it's too early for, for this group to be, uh, have drunk too much. But this is what you need to understand. And Peter steps back and he turns to the prophet Joel. And he talks about how God promised this very moment, this disruption to come upon God's people. And he speaks to how God's people were promised by God through the voice of the prophet Joel that some would prophesy, would speak to the God's future for God's people. And that some young people would have visions of what God wants and intends for God's people. And that other people, more mature people, would dream dreams about how God would come into their lives and transform them, disrupt them for the goodness of God and again for God's purposes. Peter goes on through the text of the prophet Joel and talks about how all of creation will be disruptive and, and how it will be changed until God returns and comes back and puts all things right, puts all things back together reconciles for God's purposes. A reshaping, a powerful recreation. You know, I'm far from being a master chef. I like to cook. I seem to manage pretty well, but I am, I'm not experienced as a chef. But I do know when a recipe calls for constant stirring, you better do it. Because if you don't disrupt what you're cooking, if you don't stir it, something will go wrong. It's that constant movement, that constant disruption in the right amount of heat that makes the gravy or the custard or the oatmeal just the right consistency. Moreover, it keeps it from burning and sticking to the pan. And here I go way out of my experience. I was thinking of Terry Colenbrander as an artist and a jewelry maker. And I know from listening to her love of making jewelry and how she does it, that she takes a torch. I'm imagining a hand torch, it could be bigger. And she takes that torch and she places that flame, that heat, that right amount of heat and combines it with force. So she can disrupt that metal that stock, to bend it, to refashion it, to create something beautiful that can be adorned by others. It's heat and power, bending and twisting, that allows something to be created anew. God's life-giving spirit poured out upon God's people creates delicious and beautiful examples of God's love and creative plan for new life. God's creative spirit and the way that it presents itself to us, it may not be heat, it may not be force. It may be that gentle whisper that we hear in the calmness of the night. It may be that awakening idea that comes upon us out of nowhere and directs us in a way that we never thought we would ever travel. It could be that awakening, remembrance, 
pick up the phone and give a call to someone you haven't spoken to a long time. It could be that feeling of love that comes over you and causes you to shed a tear of joy. It could be that sense of calmness and comfort that comes over you when you believe you're at your lowest point. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It could be also that, that wind, that powerful move that up ends your whole life and turns you into a whole nother person, moving on a whole nother path, direction that you never had ever predicted for yourself but can only suggest that this is God's way for you. God's life-giving spirit poured upon God's people creates delicious and beautiful examples of God's love and creative plan for new life. And today we celebrate God's promised gift of the Holy Spirit as it has been poured out upon the church. This is our life together. This is our life together in the Spirit, getting in on what God is doing. The gift of the Holy Spirit inspires and recreates, but it's all part of what God is doing. And it allows us to become partners, participants, co-creators with God. It's our way in. It's our pathway. It's our gateway into the work of God's enterprise of love. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church, but it's not just poured out upon the church. The Holy Spirit occupies and fills whatever space and place it so desires. It's free. God's freedom to choose and move in any place in any way that God so chooses. And so the church is not the, the sole vessel of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit moves and works freely through the church and beyond. We experience the, the Holy Spirit in acts of community. One stranger serving another. And those who take up the task of public life. We, the church, are not the administrators of the Holy Spirit. But in this place, in this church, we are being administered to by the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be the open vessels that we are called to be, to be the clay for the potter to shape, to allow ourselves to patiently wait and expect for God to disrupt our lives in a way that God will reorientate and help us along the way to get in on what God is doing in our midst and what God has planned for us. And so we as the church, we ought to occupy a posture or have a posture that expects and is on the lookout for God to disrupt our lives and to be disrupted by a loving spirit that gently moves and bends and prepares us to create something delicious and beautiful. The church is blessed by the spirit and given the experience of joy. When the Holy Spirit is moving and working in the church, we, we might wonder what it is. You might be a little frightened at one time or another, but the end result, when we come to understand in faith, is joy. We lift our hearts in joy and praise to God for moving us in a, a direction that we never thought maybe we would have gone before. It's all about getting in on what God is doing. And while God's power of love and peace and life disrupts us, we have to remember that it's not the only power in the world that we have to deal with. 
that there are other powers that seek to pull us out of the way of God's spirit. Other powers that seek to take command and tempt us, maybe not to be the vessels that are wide open for God's spirit. Powers of death, the powers of undoing. These powers too inbreak into our lives. The deception of life caused by the stealing away of black lives through unwarranted and abusive and violent police action. That is a power that we as a nation, as states and as communities are forced to deal with not only deal with, but to recognize our place in being the force of resistance, the nonviolent force of resistance to these powers. As people who long to be the vessels of the Holy Spirit and people who call themselves the members of the baptized community, who promised upon receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit to resist the powers of evil in all forms. And so today, as we continue to see the results of the powers of death, we must stand firm in our place as the baptized community as that resistance community empowered by the Holy Spirit for God's purposes of peace, love, and justice. God's disruptive spirit reorganizes and stirs and bends with heed and power of love so that the church can march forward in times like this, that the church can take its place and proclaim the gospel and God's intent and plan for all to experience the joy and the fullness of life and not to be encumbered by systems and structures that deny, that deny life, the fullness of life and the fullness of humanity in all the ways that we experience it. It is God's disruptive spirit that suffers with the sick and the dying. There's not an absence of God's spirit. There's an accompaniment. Jesus said that a friend and an advocate would be sent to give you words, to accompany you. Not just in the good times, but in the times where you will struggle most in life and in faith. The spirit suffers with the sick and the dying, the oppressed and the poor, the forgotten and the lonely. The spirit, the deceptive spirit, the Holy Spirit that came upon those first followers, accompany them through great times of persecution and suffering and led them forward. It is God's disruptive spirit that moves hearts and minds and hands nonviolently to resist and disrupt that which denies life. Let us remember that it is God's disruptive spirit in the midst of suffering and death. And that disruptive spirit is love. Love is God's disruptive spirit. Love made visible by the spirit led actions inside and outside of the church. Love is God's disruptive spirit. And friends, Pentecost, is a resurrection story. Spirit of God coming upon 
of people who had just come out of an experience 50 days before where they thought death had claimed victory. But no, it was not death that could claim victory. God would have the last word, and it was resurrection. God's disruptive spirit is love. God's disruptive spirit is resurrection. Come, O Holy Spirit, come into our lives. Come into our nation. Come into the streets of Minneapolis. Come into every city, every neighborhood where lives are being discounted, where black and brown neighbors are seen as invisible workers, neighbors. Come Holy Spirit and and teach us and guide us the way forward so we may truly get in on what God wants for us. Until And so today we celebrate the ongoing gift of the Spirit. The ongoing gift of the Spirit. Not just that one time that we turn to in chapter 2 of Acts. We're celebrating the ongoing gift of the Spirit. The power of God's love that creates and recreates in the midst of God's people for God's purposes. Right now. It is a celebration of God's visions and dreams that are shared with us. We are, let us never forget, God's vessels. Our hearts and our minds are open for God's visions and for God's dreams for all of creation. This is our way of life. This is our way of life in the face of all the powers that seek to separate us from God's love in one another. We must resist and wait patiently as we resist, as we say no to the powers that deny life, that structure systems that allow for some to gain a lot and for others to struggle just to have a little. We, as God's people, are called to resist and to expect God to to break into our lives and to provide us words and, and ideas and actions and how to put God's love to work. We must act in these times as the church, as the body that was given new life in the Holy Spirit. We must act and live in that direction of the Spirit that that we've been called to follow. But one last word. Caution. We must not get ahead of the Spirit. It's not for us to know the direction that the wind blows. It's for us to set our sails wide open, to be the vessels for God's spirit to fill us. And when we feel that that God has spoken to us, not to be afraid, not to doubt, not to try to write off God's spirit as some behavior, but to accept the gift the gift of God's love. To join God in this powerful enterprise of love. The task that the church has been called to, to be, to act upon, and to live out inside and outside of the walls. Let us not get ahead of the Spirit, but to travel in the wake of love that the Spirit leads us into. And let us always be ready to be disrupted.
by God's love for God's purposes. Amen. I'd like you to uh, pray with me uh, for the people of Minneapolis and for all the cities that are experiencing the turmoil, destruction, and looting. I want you to pray for peace and justice. I want you to pray for the family of George Floyd and for the police of Minneapolis and especially those who have been implicated in this hateful crime, that they will repent, that justice will be served, and that there'll be change. And not only in the Minneapolis police force, but all police forces. Continued prayers also for all who are suffering through the pandemic, for those who are grieving the loss of life. Prayers from Laura Rice for Buggy in her new home, Linda Miller, who moved this earlier this week to Texas to be with her daughter. We we'll miss her and we are thankful for her ministry in our midst. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have heard our prayers. Come, O Holy Spirit, and move us in the direction that allows us to be wide open to the way that you may disrupt our lives as an answer to our prayers. Give us strength and courage to follow in that path. Guide us as your people. Enliven our hearts and hands and help us to take an opportunity to faithfully fall and to lead in your spirit. We pray for those that we have named before you and in all those situations that have been lifted up. We ask and we humbly pray, O oh Lord, that we will grow in faith even in these times of great challenge so that we can be that new creation that you so long us to be in a world that suffers, not only in this moment, but in moments to come. Help us, O oh God, to be the laborers in your great enterprise of love. Amen. Let us pray together our prayer for God's people in this time and place. Loving God, we are thirsty for what we once knew as common and predictable. We seek each in our own way a path to your rivers of living water. Come, O source of love, and refresh your people. Release us from the weariness of this season of uncertainty. Make our hope a bit more durable for the week to come. Assign each one of us a task to do to make your love known and give us the words we need to encourage our families and neighbors. We humbly pray for what we ourselves need trusting in your will for our lives. And on this day of the month of May, the last day, we pause to acknowledge the increasing loss of life. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray for the families and individuals stricken by COVID-19. May there be ample comforters for the mournful and helpers for those without. Employ us, O oh Lord, as we may act according to your will. Amen. Please join me in a prayerful moment of silence as we pray for those grieving.
Amen. Well, our celebration of God's inbreaking, God's disruption into the life of God's people, into history, has come to an end for this morning. But it's been going on long before we even thought we'd ever gather as a church. God's been breaking in throughout history and, and guiding God's people into a way to reconcile to bring back together God's people for God's purposes. And that's the task of our church. So go forth as individual members and friends, do what you can, do what you can to keep yourself open to the spirit's direction. Don't be afraid for God to disrupt your life in a way that will get you fully employed in God's enterprise of love. Go in peace. Amen.